Matthew 28, Jesus tells his disciples to go and baptize, making disciples from all nations, to go and baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them all that, that he had taught the disciples. And so 
we are continuing in that long tradition of baptizing people and making followers of Jesus uh, and baptiz baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So Jesus taught us to do baptism. And we, we as Christians believe that baptism is a uniting with Jesus Christ and what He's already done for us, that He died and was buried, uh, but He didn't stay buried, He resurrected. And so the symbol of baptism of going under the water is uniting with Christ in his, his death, but then also rising up to a new life. So dying to the broken ways of the world and the ways we hurt each other and sin towards self and one another and saying there's a better way, there's a loving, more loving way, uh, there's the way of the kingdom of God, and we rise to that new life that he has offered us through his son Jesus Christ and we say we want to live in the way of Jesus in that new resurrected life. And so that is what Molly and Asher are declaring today, that they want to live in the kingdom of God and as a follower of Jesus Christ, and that they believe in Jesus and who he is and what he's done for them and for us. So it's a beautiful picture today, and I've, I've talked to them about baptism, that when they're covered with water, so when you see Molly and then Asher come up, out of the baptism uh, pool here and they're covered in water look at them for a second and notice that they are completely drenched in water that's kind of how water works right uh, but that's also how the love of God works all the time you are completely covered in the love of God some days we don't remember it or feel it but you are and so may, may the baptisms today remind you of what is true about our God always and may they remind you about your baptism that you have been covered by the love of God, and you're identified uh, by God as a loved child. Okay. I want to invite now Asher and Asher's dad, Tim, into the pool. And it's warm, Asher, so yeah, take it off there, but just the shirt. All right. Yeah, just the shirt. It is soft. You ready? <laughs> well, it's pretty simple. You just have to uh, do just like what Miss Molly did, okay? Mm -hmm. So what's your name? Asher Sleepers. That's good. And do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I do. And is it your desire to be baptized today? It is. Baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> well, let's uh, give thanks again through prayer. Would you pray with me? Oh God, we thank you for Molly and Asher. We thank you for your work in their lives. We thank you for your great love for them, your great love for us, and the desire you put in their hearts to follow after you and seek after you. Father, as we go from this place celebrating the wondrous work you've done in the hearts of these two people, May we all go forth in the power of your resurrection, in the power of the baptism, and truly live for you. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 I love those wind chimes. Can you hear the wind chimes? Yeah. And in the New Testament, the word for spirit and the word for wind is the same word. And so I'm thinking that the, the wind of the Spirit may be blowing in someone else's life uh, today or in the coming days. And if you or, or someone you're talking with wants to be baptized, well, this pool is closing soon. But we can find another place uh, to be baptized. Uh, and so if, if you are having that wind blow in your heart, we would love to know and, and to work out a way for someone else to be, to be baptized. But perhaps you were baptized many, many years ago. Well, the Spirit still blows a fresh wind into this world. No matter what is going on in our culture and in politics and all of that, uh, 
God is still working and doing good, and he can bring you a refreshing uh, new breath to your life. And so believe that and remember that God loves you and God is good and God is with you. Amen. May you be blessed. Thank you for being here today. Amen. Amen. Hello, I'm Pastor Corey and welcome to worship. We're glad you could join us, however you're doing it, by radio or by uh, internet, whether it's YouTube or Facebook. We're glad you're here. Uh, drop, drop a comment uh, online if you can. Let your online greeter know you're there. The online greeters are great uh, volunteers and they're here to help you. Uh, so if you have a question or you make a decision during the service, uh, they're there to communicate with you. So uh, we're glad to be here. Uh, and we're going to take two minutes now to see if someone else would like to join us. So maybe there's someone who could be here with you online or in person. Call somebody in uh, from the other room to come and experience worship with you. Uh, share this online. Send a text to somebody. Take the next two minutes and share this experience with someone else. So it's good to see you, and before we begin worship together, we do have some announcements. I want to encourage you to, to join a Bible study if you're not already in one. We have Bible studies that meet in person here at the church facility. Uh, we use masks and social distancing. We also have some online options. We have Bible studies for youth and adults. We have them in the day and in the evening. So contact the church for more information, or you can email me, Corey at PalouseChurch.org, uh, and we can connect you with a Bible study. Uh, we had some baptisms this week. We're celebrating with Molly and Asher uh, as they made decisions to be baptized. You may have seen uh, Asher's baptism video uh, just before the service. So praise God for the baptisms we had. And then I, I want to tell you about a new feature we're adding today following the, the end of both services online. We will have Bible stories for children. So after both services online starting today, we will have Bible stories for children. And that will be a, a weekly feature of our worship services. So, so check that out if you have a kiddo. Uh, get them ready to watch that. And that's kind of in place of our Sunday school uh, ministry for now. Uh, all right. Those are the announcements I want to give. But we're going to have some announcements now on video. Hey everybody, I'm Tim Sievers. I'm the Connection Director here at Palouse Federated Church, and I'm glad uh, you could be with us today. Wanted to bring your attention to a special prayer meeting that we're having after the services each Sunday, after the 9 o'clock service and the 11 o'clock service. You can join us on Zoom for a time of prayer. 
think this is especially important in this time as we're separated uh, from one another, that we come together, that we connect together as God's people and with God. So we hope you can join us. Uh, the Zoom link you can get from your online greeter or send us an email at the church or give us a call and we'll be happy to get that information to you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tina Lahari and I lead a ladies Bible study. We meet Thursdays at four o'clock on Zoom and we open God's word to study the scripture that Corey is going to preach on the next Sunday. So right now we are in the book of John. We'd love to have you join us. You can email me or contact the church and we will get you connected. Hi, I'm Vanessa Moore. I am the youth leader at Clues Federated Church. We have two youth groups going on right now. We have a junior high group that meets on Wednesdays from 6.30 to 7.30, and we are going every other week with in-person and Zoom calls currently. And then we are also starting up a high school group that will meet on Sundays from 6.30 to 7.30 as well. If you are interested in either of these, please, please feel free to just come or contact either the church or I. Thank you. Hi, it's Pastor Corey, and I wanted to invite you to the Bible studies that I lead. There's Tuesday morning at 5.30 a.m. We have a men's Bible study Tuesday, 5.30 a.m. And then Tuesday at 10 a.m. we have a Bible study for everyone. And then Wednesday nights now at 6.30 p.m. we have a Bible study for everyone. All those Bible studies are in person uh, at the church uh, with masks required and social distance. And the Tuesday morning 5.30 one has a uh, Zoom hybrid option. I think my information's on the screen, but you can email me, uh, Corey at PalouseChurch.org. That's C-O-R-E-Y. Hi there, I'm Betty Sawyer, and I'm a Bible study leader for a bunch of ladies who meet together on Zoom every Wednesday morning at 9 a.m., and we'd love to have you join us. We study the same thing that uh, Corey is preaching on the upcoming Sunday, and it's always a pretty lively discussion. So join us. You can find us on Facebook. You can email me. You can email the church and find out more information. But we'd love to have you join. Hey, good morning. This is Jim Fielder. Whoops, I should probably take off my mask. I'm here at the church. Uh, I'm going to meet with Corey for a bit uh, discuss some things. Uh, but I'm sitting here looking at our task force meeting minutes. and. Uh, was just uh, wanted to let you folks know that we're going to have a uh, town hall meeting, basically a congregation meeting this coming Sunday at 5 p.m. Uh, that information should be uh, over here on the just to my uh, my left, and uh, it's uh, going to be a time we can gather together. Uh, if you don't have an internet connection or you'd like to come do it here live at the church, you'll need to call for reservation. Uh, call the church at 509. 878-1509 and uh, we'll get you on the list. We will have a limited seating. It'll be limited to 10 people. So if you'd like to uh, join us at the church uh, to uh, make this meeting a hybrid, some of you can be here watching on the big screen in the fellowship hall. Uh, we're looking forward to having that time together with you. Well, most of us will probably be on Zoom and uh, we will uh, discuss things that are going on, talk about the current uh, plans for reopening and uh, where we're at as a church and a congregation. We've got some exciting things going as we look forward to uh, uh, this upcoming Advent season uh, and uh, probably even the thankfulness campaign coming on. So look forward to talking to you more later. Thanks a lot. I'll talk to you later. Hey, I wanted to talk to you about our education mini grants. We are offering $100 for any teacher, teacher's aide, uh, student, parent that needs something for, uh, for education in this pandemic season and strange season we find ourselves in. So if you're out there and you could use uh, maybe new headphones or a, a USB drive or $100 worth of childcare, hey, all you gotta do for this grant, it, it's pretty easy to win a grant. So you go onto our online link and it's a real short form. You tell us why you need some funds that would help with your education or your student's education, your kid's education, and then we will probably say yes. We'll cut you a check, and then you tell us how it went. Send us a picture of what you purchased or what you did with the $100, or it could be $50, $25, up to $100. So that's the Education Mini Grants, and we hope you would take advantage of it. 
All right, we have gathered together, though we're in separate places, we're gathered by the Holy Spirit to worship together. And so I want to read our call to worship from Exodus 32 and then pray to begin worship. Exodus is the second book in the Bible, right after uh, Genesis. Genesis is the book of the beginnings. Exodus is the book of leavings of when the people of uh, Israel left Egypt. And we're going to be reading from Exodus chapter 32, starting with verse 1. A a difficult story uh, for the people of Israel. It's about the golden calf. Exodus 32, starting with verse 1. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down, for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume, consume them, in order that I may make a great nation of you. But Moses implored the Lord, his God, and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent did he bring them out, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. And the word, excuse me, and the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. O Lord God, we thank you for your mercy. Why, while we were yet sinners, your son was on the cross for our sake. O Lord, we, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be merciful to us today, that you would meet us, imperfect as we are, and you would use your Holy Spirit in this worship service, wherever people are at, that you would, uh, through your grace, restore our lives into the, the image bearers that you want us to be, people who live uh, life like you lived life, with love, with truth, with grace. So I ask, O oh Lord, that your Holy Spirit would meet us here in this time, inhabit this worship service. May you be glorified. May you prepare us to do your good this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship God together.
We're going to be moving into our time of prayer and we want to invite you to be a part of that. Uh, one of the beautiful things about the people of God is that we have this gift that he's given us, this way to communicate for us to share our heart with him and for him to share his heart with us if we can quiet our minds and our hearts and truly listen. And so as we move into this time of prayer, I want to invite you to do just that, to quiet your heart, to quiet your mind, and listen for God to speak to you. We're going to start by praying together the Lord's Prayer, and then I'll lead us in our congregational prayer. Would you pray with me as our Lord Jesus taught us to pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. O oh God, in these next few quiet moments, we ask for your help to put the distractions of the world out of our minds. Help us to hear your voice speaking to us. O oh God, we pray for the needs of our world, that all our community might know what is God and what is Caesar's, and may have the courage so to live. That as the Lord guided Israel, God would guide our country, its leaders and its citizens. We pray especially for our president and our Congress, for our governor and legislature, for our mayor and city council. We pray, O oh God, in these difficult days that you would guide them, that they could discern your will and your direction and what is good and right for all of us. We pray, O oh God, that justice and peace will be signs of our trust in you. We pray for the church, that in the spirit of Paul, we might preach the gospel not merely in words, but in the mighty power of the Holy Spirit. For each of us following Jesus, may we be truthful courting no one's favor, but living with simplicity and honesty. And like the apostle and all the people in the church, may we live our faith and labor and love for the poor, the homeless, the imprisoned, the persecuted and the sick, and that by your power the suffering of all creation might be relieved that wherever there is violence, we might be enabled to confess our part in allowing that darkness to continue. For we have shut our eyes to the bruises and shut our ears to the cries of fear and pain, that your healing, O oh God, might come to all places. O oh God, we pray that we might remember with gratitude the witness of those who have kept faith in your name And it's into your hands, O oh God, that we place our well-being. Trusting in you, that you know and see the needs of all. We pray these things through the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're going to continue our worship with the reading of Scripture. Our second reading comes from the book of Philippians, 
the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 9. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Yodia and I entreat Sintichi to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. We're going to continue our worship by giving, and I want to thank all of you who give so that we can have the ministry we have together. Uh, we're going to be talking about our ministry, uh, just as a reminder, tonight at 5 o'clock at our churchwide town hall, and why we're doing some of the things we're doing, why we're not doing some of the things we're doing, and, and how it's a blessing to be the church together. So that's tonight at 5 o'clock. Uh, I want to thank you for all your gifts to, uh, to our general budget, but I want to thank you especially for a... Uh, a special offering we've been taking for fire relief. Uh, many of you have donated to that fund and 100% of the fire relief funds are gonna go to people affected by the fire. Particularly, we were able to connect with one, uh, one small family, a mom, Heidi, and her son, Jace, who lost their home in the Malden fire. And we're gonna be coming alongside Heidi and Jace for the next several months and helping them where we can with needs and perhaps a work party on her land. Uh, so stay tuned for, for how we can help Heidi and Jace. If you'd like to give to the Fire Relief Fund, you can do that online. There's a designation there. You can mail in a check and just make the check out to the church, but in the, on the envelope or on the memo line, just put Fire Relief, and 100% of those uh, donations will go to the Fire Relief Fund. Uh, so thank you for giving. We really appreciate it.
I believe that, that life really leads to faith, or, or another way to say it is, in this life we have to have faith of one kind or another. And so I, I want to throw a question out to you. What miracle, what, what miracle are you believing in? And I want to give you three options. Because the, the first option I see is that we believe that everything just came together as a great cosmic accident. That this whole universe, this whole thing we call life, came together as a great cosmic accident. And in this option number one, uh, there's no God. Uh, God isn't needed. It's just atoms and subatomic particles colliding. And, and somehow we are just a miracle, you could say, a natural miracle of ancient sub subatomic energy uh, and particles colliding. You know, I'm not even saying it the right way, but you get my drift. And, and then, you know, later on in that, in that option, people come up with uh, faith systems and, and Christians come up with a cross and a resurrection story to try to give us hope for life after death. But in option number one, uh, life is just a natural miracle of, of coincidence and, and we just happen to be here, okay? And we make up our meaning. Do we believe that? Uh, second option, option two, do we believe there's a God? So a lot of people believe there's a God, you know, because there had to be a God behind this, this universe and, and for us to have life and with all the intricacies in biological life and in the stars, uh, we believe there's a God in the sec second option, but the God doesn't want to be known and doesn't want to uh, trifle with us, you know, creatures here. And so then we just, we as human beings who were made by a God, but aren't able to know this God, we miraculously make up really good stories about a relatable God who comes to us and becomes one of us named Jesus. He's not, in, in option two, he's not really real, but we have to make him up so that we can have a relatable God that helps us in our deepest places of need and then helps us also to live after we die. Do you believe option two? Or the third option, do we really believe what the scriptures tell us, do we really believe what the scriptures tell us that there is indeed a actual relational God behind all of life and this God comes to us out of, out of eternity to be our light and our life and knows our deep needs and becomes the way that we are made able to dwell in the presence of God eternal. Do we believe? in that story of the scripture? Do we believe option one, that it's just, life is just a beautiful accident? Do we believe option two, well, there's a God behind this, but, but uh, we can't really know that God, and so we make up religious stories to help get by in this life? Or do we believe the biblical option, do we really believe the biblical option, the radical option, the third option I said, that there's a relational God who comes to us and meets us where we're at? You see, each of these claims, each of these claims uh, require a type of faith. Believing in something beyond what we as, as mere human beings can, can prove with our reason. Even, even the scientific claims, we can't prove everything. We can't prove, uh, you know, if you believe what happened 14 billion years ago. But it requires some faith. And only one of those options that I listed can be fully true. And only one of those options, I would say, is full of grace and truth. And this is what we've come here to hear today. The story of the relational God who comes to earth, fully and freely offering you and I life and life eternal. A gracious free offer that is completely real and true. So, don't we all wanna know what the point of this life is, right? This, this, this crazy thing we call life? Do you, do you ever find yourself wondering, is this all a crazy cosmic accident? Am I an accident? Maybe a tragedy in your life or difficulties in this world recently have got you wondering, is there really a loving, relational God behind all of this? There's so much difficulty in the pain and pain in the world. Is there really a loving, gracious God behind it all? Well, yeah, I believe it. I believe that there's a God behind it all who came to us and God is most clearly known and revealed through Jesus Christ. And if this is true, if this is true, that claim that God can be known and he is most fully known through Jesus Christ, this is very, very good news. So be encouraged, friends. Life is no accident. The universe is not chaos. And behind all of life is grace and truth. Let's pray. 
Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, may they be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord. For you are truly our rock and our redeemer. You alone should we rightly fear. You alone should we fully follow. And you alone should our life be founded upon. May your Holy Spirit work through uh, the words that I say today, Lord. May you touch the people where, where they need it. And may you lead us to, to be uh, your people who live in grace and truth. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to be in the Gospel of John chapter 1, starting with verse 14. It says this, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about Him and cried out, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because He was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. This is a wonderful section of scripture. I just want to cruise through, through it again in a way. It says the word became flesh. That word became is the word agenito. In, in, the, in the, the Greek, it's, just this, it's got the same root word as genesis. Genesis, actually. So, you know, he's, he's connecting this to God's creation again. This, this word, the word, is that word logos that we considered a couple sermons ago. The, the brain or the wisdom behind the whole universe actually became flesh, the scripture says. This this idea that he became material, became human. Uh, he didn't just seem to be human. He became uh, human and he dwelt. He dwelt, or this is a physical word for uh, dwelling or pitching a tent. It's also the word that, that could be translated as tabernacle. Remember the tabernacle of the Old Testament where God dwelt with the, the people of Israel in the desert. So the, the word of God comes and becomes flesh and his presence dwells or tabernacles with God's people and we have seen his glory. Uh, glory connects to this uh, in the New Testament connects back to the idea of God's glory in the Old Testament, a, a cool world, a word called Shekinah, God's, God's weighty sacred presence, okay, God's glory. And as of the only one, the only one that can really bring it, he has a unique role. He's not just a God amongst the pantheon of gods, but he is the unique Son from the Father, full of grace and truth, the one that John the Baptist pointed to. And from all his fullness we have received grace upon grace. And then in verse 17, he connects Jesus to Moses, uh, you know, saying that Moses' ministry of bringing the law is really fulfilled by what Jesus brings, the grace and truth he brings. And that no one has ever seen God, but Jesus reveals him, we see in verse 18, who God really is and what God is, is really like. So I want to go through uh, each of these bits here, I guess, in a, a little bit deeper way. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This, this answers the who is Jesus question we've been asking as we go through the Gospel of John. Who is Jesus? Well, He's the Word, right? He's the Word. And first, I just want to pause and say, this is the first time we've seen the name Jesus in the Gospel of John. Look at verse 17, where it says Jesus Christ in verse 17. That's the first time the name Jesus is in the Gospel of John, okay? So before that, he's referring to him as the Word, the Lagos, right? Or the light, or he's our life. But, but here we see his name. So who is Jesus? He's, he's the Word behind it all, the one who made all things. He's divinity. He is God. But also we're seeing here, he became flesh. So he's fully divine and he is fully human. That's what Christians have believed. He is fully God, fully man. We have believed this radical thing that we aren't trying to reconcile and, and see that as a problem. We just believe it's radically true about our God that he became one of us. He pitched his tent, right, in our midst. He really, he really set up a dwelling here. He tabernacled with us. Just like the glory of God filled that special tent uh, that, he, that he had Israel make way back in Exodus, uh, the glory of God really did dwell sacredly in, in, the, in the presence, in the life, in the body of Jesus Christ. You know, the, the, the presence of God's glory was so real in Exodus chapter 40. It talks about that Moses couldn't go into the tabernacle. And, and, and God was real in Jesus Christ. He didn't just seem or appear to be a human being. Uh, he was a human being. 
This is startling good news, friends. Uh, this is startling good news, and it's also at the same time a message that divides people. Because you either believe that God entered into the world and became one of us, or you don't, right? You either believe that third option that I said in the intro, or you don't. Do, do we have a God that really became human? I believe that that, it, that is something only God can do, right? Uh, we, could, we could make up a story about it. It could just be a myth. But if it's true, if it is truly a supernatural fact, it is startling good news that we have a God who loves us and comes to us. And we call this startling miracle the incarnation, or God taking on flesh. And this separates, this, this miracle of God becoming one of us, this separates basically historic Christianity, biblical Christianity, from basically every other belief system, in that God graciously becomes one of us. God becomes one of us and was seen. It says we have seen. We have seen. John, uh, who's writing this, and the early church community, they, they saw this. They, they walked, they ate with Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus, the Son of God. And he's clearly expressing this belief that God became flesh. We witnessed it. We saw it. We experienced it. And he says it in the plural, right? We have seen. He's talking, I think, about the community of believers that, that lived and walked with Jesus and saw, too, the, the resurrected Jesus. And so like Israel, the Old Testament with Moses, they saw and experienced to some degree the glory of God. The people of Israel saw the shining face of Moses. They, they saw the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire. They saw great miracles. Like Israel experienced the glorious uh, revealing of God in an in a, in a even more beautiful way, I guess, or a fulfilling way, the followers of Jesus saw and came to believe that the presence of God was in human form. Real people, real women like Mary Magdalene and Martha, her sister, the Samaritan woman at the well that we're going to read about in John chapter 4, the, the women at the foot of the cross, including Jesus' own earthly mother, and the women at the, at the empty tomb, and, and men like Thomas who at first doubted it, people like Peter who had denied Jesus after Jesus was arrested. These folks, as imperfect as they were, saw and experienced God in human form and that changed them and they believed it and they passed it down because they had seen it they had seen God's glory in the presence of a human being Jesus so God's glory what is it God's glory it's I guess you could say it's the greatness it's the sacredness it's the presence of God it's a hard word to define but again, I would go back to that tabernacle idea in the Old Testament that, to see that glory connection. You could go to Exodus 40 and read a little bit about that. Uh, you could also go to other places in the Old Testament, like Isaiah the prophet, where he has a vision of, of uh, just a majestic God in Isaiah 6. And, you know, he, he ends up saying, you know, I'm a man of unclean lips among the people of unclean lips, you know, because he's just near this, this, this vision of God. And so occasionally in history or in, in visions, God breaks through with the dramatic revealing of, of who God is it, it, with God's glory. But here we see God's glory in Jesus is not just revealed in, in bright light or, or pillars of fire or, or like Jesus when he's transfigured in Matthew 17 on, on the mountain and, and they, they see some of his disciples see his bright light. Uh, God's glory is not always like that. God's glorious presence shown in Jesus' life is also about service and death and an empty tomb, resurrection. And so part of the glory that we experience with Jesus, that John experienced with Jesus, that he, he saw with his own eyes, is, you could say, the lowliness, in a sense. The lowliness. What shows the glory of God in Jesus? The cross. And the, the shame of what human beings did to the perfect, loving Son of God. And yet, that God, that God took it, you know, didn't wipe us out. Didn't, didn't come, come down and just eviscerate or, you know, just completely destroy earth or the whole universe for killing, for killing the perfect son. But instead, the glorious, loving God uses the cross and says, you gave me your worst and I will make it the way that I reconcile you. I, I will make it what you have to look upon to be forgiven. And so the lowliness of God, how he, how he becomes obedient to death, not just death, but death on a cross, as Paul says in Philippians 2, that reveals the, the glory of God in Jesus Christ, that he has conquered the tyranny of death through the cross and through the resurrection. 
So what is glory? I, I'm trying to say glory is the way we describe experiencing God's presence. We, we often attach it to praise because when we're praising God, we're admitting his goodness and his presence. Even you can see uh, in, in, in the traditional song we sing at the end of the nine o'clock service, the doxology. D-O-X is the start of doxology, right? In the Greek, the word for the root word for, uh, for glory is doxa. You know, it's connected to a word for praise, praise. You know, and, and it's, it's, it's heavy, it's weighty, it's sacred, it's connected to honor. And I would say all of these are, we're kind of, we're kind of losing that in our culture. We don't want to talk about it, maybe the heavy, meaningful things. We'd rather argue. We, we're losing a sense of sacredness and honor. But God never will lose that. And John had seen that, and the others had seen that in Jesus Christ. So sometimes in our beautiful world, we feel or we experience this glory, this presence of God in the, in the deep moments of our life that really can only happen or that we can really only fully explain because there's a God, I think. For example, birth and just the beauty and miraculousness of it. We, we experience God's beauty there or our glory there in that beautiful miracle. Death and the crossing over of a, of a, of a saint you know, as, as painful as it is, is we, we, we experience, I bet some of you have that weightiness, that presence, that there is something sacred going on. Grief, a, a difficult experience as it is, it feels weighty, it feels heavy. The person is gone and we can't just move on and be exactly the same as where, what we were because something sacred has happened. A leaving has happened and it must be acknowledged. And so... These things happen in life. It could be something really positive, like a beautiful experience, a, a beautiful piece of music, a beautiful sunrise or sunset, and a, an amazing time of worship and praise where you, you literally feel the weighty presence of God. Maybe it's an uplifting presence of God, but you, you feel something, the Spirit of God and God's glory, the presence and awareness of the spiritual and the eternal in this physical world. Have you had that experience? I pray that you have where we realize that we are, though we are material, though we are flesh, we are more than material and flesh. We are spiritual. And God meets us in our flesh and we feel and we can say with John, we have seen and experienced the glory of God. We can do it in God's beautiful nature. You can go out and look at the stars tonight. Here's an image of the stars. The, and Psalm 19, one says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky proclaims God's handiwork. Or you can do it like I did on the bus this week and you just look out over the hills of Palouse and I think there's a picture of our wonderful blue sky on the screen for you. Of just, just sometimes the contrast of the blue and the fields and just the beauty of God and you feel something. Is it just, is it just neurons? Is it just, you know, good feelings about scenery? Are you beginning to touch the glory of God and the beauty of God's handiwork? God's fullness. The scripture talks about God's fullness. God's fullness dwelt in Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean that the Father wasn't in heaven and that the Holy Spirit and the Father and Jesus, you know, that Jesus was just wearing a mask and sometimes he's the Spirit, sometimes the Father. When it talks about his fullness, it's, it, it's saying that he is fully God. It, that doesn't deny that the Father is also God and the Holy Spirit is God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one God. But from God's fullness in Jesus, it's saying we are given what we need. The grace and truth that we need. Now, if, if you just, I, I think you have to agree with me on this one. That God's fullness is beyond our imagination. You know, I cannot really imagine or use my limited intellect to figure out what does God's fullness mean? How much wisdom does God have? How much beauty can God create? You know, what is the depth of God's forgiveness? I, I, I can't really answer for you what is God's fullness. But I can tell you out of God's fullness, out of the depth of God's goodness, mad, the massive love God has for us, God sent his son, Jesus, for us. You know, one scriptural image that, uses, uh, that is used to try to explain God's fullness and love for us, it says God has separated our sins as far as east is from west. Well, how far is east is from west? I mean, how far is west from east? If they just keep on going west and east, they're infinitely far from each other. And it says God has separated us from our brokenness that much. God does that out of God's fullness. Some of you think God doesn't have enough forgiveness for me. But when you do that, you're limiting 
by your limited imagination, God's fullness. God can't really love me. Do you know how messed up I am? Do you know how broken I am? Do you know how I screwed up in this relationship or this job? But God loves us out of God's fullness, not based on what you think you merit. God loves us in an unmerited way. That's what grace is. Unmerited kindness towards us, unmerited favor towards us, unearned love. And God does this out of God's fullness. He's, he's not pulling from a bucket uh, to say, oh, well, Corey's done this much, so I'll love him this much. God is pulling out of God's resources, which is a fullness that I can't even imagine. Another place where this is just uh, spoken to us very clearly is Romans chapter 8. You can go there and read it for yourself. If you don't read Romans chapter 8 once a month, you should. It's really good it, it, for your soul. Okay, Read it more often than that. If you want, Romans 8 talks about that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you really believe that? I think some Christians say it and they've read it, but then they say, oh yeah, but this has separated me. Or, you know, I got a divorce. Or I failed here and now I'm out. But the scriptures say nothing can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Another biblical image about God's fullness is that there is nowhere we can hide from God's spirit. One of my favorite Psalms, Psalms 139, says there is nowhere we can hide from God's spirit. If, we make our, if we're up in the heavens and we're feeling great, if we're down in the depths on our, on our deathbed and we're feeling terrible, nothing can separate us from God's spirit. No darkness, it says, can overcome God's light. Even if it feels like darkness is surrounding you, the psalm says even darkness is not darkness to God. Darkness is as light to God. God loves us out of God's fullness. And that's far, 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 far greater than our brokenness and our weakness. Let's stop defining God by our measurements and let God be defined by God's fullness, which is greater than our imagination. He can do far more than we can ask or imagine. He can restore you and, and give you renewal in your life where you think it can't happen. God can do that because God does it out of God's fullness. God gives grace and truth to us. Gift upon gift, or grace upon grace. Let's look at grace and truth. Jesus is the embodiment of grace and truth. What does that mean? Well, as I said earlier, grace is unearned kindness, unmerited favor, freely given love to us. And truth, truth, what is that? Truth is telling us our real condition. God getting honest with us. Uh, as Tim said earlier in the service, truly speaking to our hearts, if we would quiet ourselves and, and let let God's voice in there, he will tell us the truth of our real condition. Sometimes that means he will convict us of things. Sometimes that means he will deeply encourage us. Sometimes he'll do both, right? He tells us our real identity and our real needs. So many people are searching in this world to make up their own identity. And identity is a big issue in our culture today. But the best way to get your identity is to receive your identity from God and to be the image bearer that you were created to be, to let God restore your brokenness so you can bear the image of God in your life and love others and love God, right? That's who you were created to be. And God wants to graciously do that to you. He wants to freely restore everything that's broken about you and I. And he wants to tell us the truth when we start to dabble in brokenness again. So he tells us the truth and he is gracious. We're gonna see grace and truth throughout the Gospel of John as we experience Jesus. And, and as you do that, I, wanna, I want you to be asking, I want you and I to be asking, am I really experiencing this grace and truth? And am I looking more like Jesus, who was full of grace and truth? Am I allowing the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God, to reshape, renew, reform me, to be a person who is more filled with grace and truth? Because our goal, friends, isn't to just become better Christians and members of an organization and do more churchy stuff. Our goal is to reflect more and more of the image of God, more and more of the fullness of God in our life. And the Spirit can do that in you. That's what you were created for, to have a relationship with a relational God who can reflect God's goodness out of your life. So are you on that journey of having more grace and truth in your life? More unearned love flowing out of your heart to others. More loving, kind truth being shared to others that will bless and encourage others. It happens in real life. 
It happens in real life for us. For you and I, the way Jesus does it, does it for me and, and for you, hopefully, is he, he's, he says, I, I want to assure you that you're forgiven. You've done something, you know, this week, maybe you think, oh, it's the hundredth time I've done that. I was short with my kids or whatever. You think, this time it's unforgivable. But he's full of grace and truth. He'll tell you the truth. Yeah, you shouldn't have done that. But I, I, I want to renew you and lead you in a better way. It's the message of love from Jesus when you feel spiritually ugly, when you feel unlovable, maybe not from something you've done, but from what other people have said. But Jesus is full of grace and truth, and his identity says for you is that you are a loved child. It's the awareness that Jesus is your great protection, even when there's fear of disease and death in our culture. He defeated evil and death at the cross. He conquered, he conquered the tyranny of the tomb, the gloom of the tomb. And so he whispers to your soul, to my soul, who we really are. He graciously speaks to us and he gives us the spirit when we believe to encourage us when we are down. He will correct us, and we need that, right? But he will give us gift upon gift, grace upon grace, as it says here. You know, he doesn't just save you. Grace isn't just about salvation and getting into heaven. The scriptures teach us that he gives us grace upon grace. He makes us new. He, he, he fixes our brokenness. He gives us purpose and mission. He draws us into a community of, of people who will encourage and help us. He, he makes us people who can reflect the image of God in the world. And he rescues us into an eternal existence. Grace upon grace. Gift upon gift. It's so much more than just, I was saved to go to heaven, right? Grace upon grace is who God is. He gave us life and life abundant is how Jesus is going to say it in chapter 10. So I want you to turn to somebody if you're watching with somebody right now or, or text somebody and I want you to just say, wow, God is really good. Can you do that? God is really good. Just turn to somebody and do that because God is really good, right? Grace upon grace out of God's fullness. God is made known to us in Jesus Christ. And, and we can't handle seeing all the fullness of God. The, the people of Israel couldn't. We can't see all the fullness of God. But the good news is God came to us and revealed God's nature to us through Jesus Christ. So God is made known by Jesus Christ. This here again is the first mention of the name Jesus in verse 17 in the Gospel of John. And, and really what this verse and verse 18 help us do, and we're going to see it throughout the gospel when Jesus says, like, I and the Father are one. If you have seen me, if you've seen the Father, Jesus is going to say some pretty radical, intense things like that. And when you read the whole gospel of John, you're going to see, man, God is bigger than I imagined. God is Father. Yes. God is Son. Yes. God is Holy Spirit. And God is God. You're going to see that. It's, it's a clear message in the gospel of John. And you're going to say, what, how do I reconcile that? You don't. Right? John doesn't try to reconcile it for you. He just tells you uh, the fullness of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who loves you, who loves you. So my question is, do we believe this? Do we receive this? Do you believe that third option from the beginning of the sermon, that there is indeed a relational God behind all of life, that life is not an accident, that, that indeed there is a God who comes to us, to be our light and our life. That this isn't made up, that it's actually starting, startling, I can't even say that, but that it's just such good news. That, that there's a God who knows my deep needs, your deep needs, and becomes the way that we are made whole and made able to dwell with the presence of God eternal. Is our God really known through Jesus Christ our Lord? Yes, is the answer. And he gives gift upon gift. Our God, Jesus Christ, is filled to the brim and overflowing with unmerited, unearned offers of forgiveness, of wisdom, of soul-satisfying joy, of life-giving peace, of certain hope, of selfless love. He's giving it all to us if we would receive it. The great carpenter who made all things and made you came to restore us, to rebuild us, to build a new kingdom up, to turn death on its head and to make the way for us to have life and life to the full. Jesus came to be God in our midst, to make God known and to leave God the Spirit here with us. 
Jesus is God's declaration of love and victory. And friends, this is freely given and it is absolutely real and it is fully trustworthy. I want to pray right now as we end. I want to pray for those of you who might be saying, you know, I really want to accept this for the first time. I also want to pray for you out there who need a renewal and just just a reminder that God is loving you out of God's fullness and not based on your performance. If you want to uh, contact us, you can do it next at pollutionchurch.org or prayer at pollutionchurch.org. You can can call us if you want to say, I I need to be baptized and, and, and publicly say, this is who I am that I'm washed completely, covered completely with the love of Jesus. Maybe that's your next step. Whatever your next step is, would you just join me in prayer right now? Father, I pray for those who are considering the the next step of of receiving you for the first time. That perhaps through this scripture or their journey through John or however you're working, they have just seen and believed that you are a good, loving God who has what they need. That life is not an accident. Life is... It is, is not meaningless that, that you are the one who gives us life and meaning and purpose and hope. Lord, for those who are out there, lead them in a prayer like this. God, I give my life to you. You have made me. You sent your son for me. And I receive the, the grace and the truth he has for me. Lead me in the new life. Lead me in the way of your kingdom. And Lord, I pray for those who need renewal right now. For those who might think they've been really good at religion, maybe some of them who think they've been really bad at it, uh, wherever they're at, Lord, I pray for those who need renewal. Lord, help us with this prayer. Lord, just by your spirit, blow a fresh wind in our souls. Help us to see that our spiritual life is not based on our performance, but on your fullness, on your goodness, on your grace, on your un- unmerited kindness, Lord. Speak truth to us, truth of our forgiveness, truth of better ways we could live. Tell us the truth, Lord. And Lord, I pray for all who are hearing this, Lord. I pray that we would go on the journey of looking more like you each day, full of grace and truth, Lord. I grieve that that is not how the church is often described now. I grieve that we as Christians are are not often described as people who are full of grace and truth. I grieve that our culture is not full of kindness or even basic civility often. Oh Lord, would your Holy Spirit work in me, in us, and make us more like your Son, full of true kindness, true compassion, true graciousness. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God for his word.
Thank you for joining us in worship today. I'm praying for you this week uh, that you would, would go on the journey of becoming more like Jesus. Simply pray, God, help me to be more like Jesus today. Fill me with grace and truth. I believe that's a prayer that God wants to answer. So may you be blessed in your journey this week and may God fill us all with grace and truth. Amen. to see you today and to share a story with you from God's book, the Bible. And parents, if you're interested in following along in scripture, this story of David and Goliath comes from 1 Samuel chapter 17 verses 1 through 51. Let's start. There was a war in the land of Israel. The Philistine armies had come to fight and they were ready and waiting in their mountaintop camp. King Saul and the men of Israel <clears throat> were ready too and they waited atop another mountain across the valley. A champion came out of the Philistine camp. He was a giant named Goliath of Goth. He cried to the men of Israel, Choose a champion for yourselves. If he is able to kill me, then the Philistines will be your servants. But if I kill him, then you shall be our servants. Give me a man to fight. When Saul and the men of Israel heard these words, they were greatly afraid. They did not have a man who could defeat a giant. Now, there was a boy named David, and he was the youngest of eight sons. While three of his older brothers served in the army, David took care of his father's sheep in Bethlehem. One day David's father sent for him, and he told David to take some food to his brothers and the captain and, and to bring back news of the war. David awoke early in the morning, and he took the food and set out for King Saul's camp. When he arrived, David left the food with the supply keeper, and then he went to find his brothers. As David talked with his brothers, Goliath came out again to challenge the army of Israel. When the men of Israel saw Goliath, they were frightened and ran away. Some men said to David, do you see this giant? King Saul will give riches and his own daughter in marriage to the man who can kill him. And David said, who is this Philistine to threaten the army of the living God? When the people heard David's words, they ran to tell them to King Saul. And then Saul sent for David. David said, let no one fear Goliath. I will go and I will fight this man. But Saul said, you cannot fight him. You are just a boy and he is a trained soldier. And David said to King Saul, I kept my father's sheep. A lion came and it took a lamb out of the flock and I went out after the lamb and I took it from the lion's mouth and I killed the lion. Oh, the giant shall be like that lion. The Lord who delivered me from the lion will deliver me from this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go and the Lord be with you. King Saul gave David his own armor to wear in the battle. And David tried it on. And then he said, I cannot wear this armor. I'm just not used to it. And he took off Saul's armor. David took up his staff. 
Well, that's a, a tall walking stick with a hook on it that the shepherds used to guide their sheep. He picked five smooth stones out of a brook and put them in his shepherd's bag. He took his sling and went out to meet Goliath. When the Philistines saw David with his staff, he said, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And David answered, you come to me with a sword and a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord, the God of the army of Israel. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand and all the earth may know there is God in Israel. David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone, and he put the stone in his sling and took careful aim. Then he swung the sling and let go, and the stone struck the Philistine's forehead, and Goliath fell to the ground. David ran and took Goliath's sword and cut off the giant's head. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they grew afraid and ran away. The men of Israel ran after them and drove them off. So David defeated the Philistines with a sling and a stone and the help of the living God. The end. Will you join me in a prayer? Dear Lord, Thank you for this time together today to hear your word through a story that tells us things about our lives, about trusting in God when times get hard and we don't know if, if we have the strength to do what needs to be done. God wants us to trust in him as David did. Let's let that be part of our lives. I just ask God to bless all of you and all of your families, and I can't wait to see you again. Bye-bye.